the first keynote of the day, which is given by Miranda Schröers. It's an honor and pleasure to welcome you to uh, Lisbon and, and to this conference. Um, and Miranda is the Chair of Environmental and Climate Policy at the Technical University of Munich. She's had many, many different um, occupations that are at the intersection of academia and policymaking. Um, I'll, I'll just mention a couple of them. Um, she was a member of the German Council on the Environment from 2008 to 2016. Uh, and served as uh, vice chair and chair of the European Advisory Council on Environment and Sustainable Development. And currently, she's a member of the spatial planning advisory body to the Federal Ministry of Housing, Urban Development and Building. So even I needed a sheet of paper for that. Um, <laughs> thanks a lot. Um, and Miranda has been working in the field for 30 years or whatever. Uh, I remember that we met somewhere in the 90s in Berlin, I think, for the first time. Um, and she's been working on various issues, but especially also on Asia, Europe, the US. Uh, and she will talk today about glo global competition for green leadership, where these players, I think, uh, will, will be addressed. Very much looking forward to your keynote, uh, Miranda. Uh, great to have you here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, thank you, Helge, for inviting me. Uh, really a pleasure to be here. And I think I've got the system figured out. You nod when you want to have the next slide. So we'll go ahead and nod and get to the next slide. So I want to talk to you today about um, climate change and how three of the biggest polluters are dealing with climate change. And I want to do that um, going back a little bit in history, bringing it up to today. And I only mentioned the Kyoto Protocol to remind you that we've been working on this problem for a long time. And if you think back to 1997, when the Kyoto Protocol was being negotiated, um, it was an agreement that uh, was largely being pioneered by the United States and the European Union, with China um, basically still at a stage where China was saying, uh, we are a developing country and responsibility for climate change is the US and Europe, where historical emissions were coming from the US and Europe. And you note that I said it was pioneered by the US and Europe. But at the same time, the United States began what I call a roller coaster, the roller coaster of US climate policy, because it helped to champion the Kyoto Protocol and then never signed and ratified it. And um, when, when George Bush became president, he called the Kyoto Protocol dead on arrival. So US roller coaster begins. Next slide, please. And I jumped in time, we have the Paris Agreement, and we once again see a little bit of this roller coaster ride where the United States, where we have actually some of the strongest environmental groups in the world and um, very, very dramatic, um, uh, important climate science going on, that um, when um, the United States uh, was helping to formulate the Paris Agreement, under the Obama administration, it was very much the sense it's important to be a player in this global problem. But we also know that shortly thereafter, Donald Trump pulled the United States out of the agreement. So once again, we have a bit of a roller coaster going on here. And when we think about the Paris Agreement and the Kyoto Protocol, there's a lot of literature that basically says the European Union was the champion of these international agreements, that the European Union held the agreements together even after the United States pulled out. And one more thing important to remember, the difference between Kyoto and Paris is that with Paris, China is on board. China has been pulled into the agreement and is no longer saying we're a developing country, the responsibility is all Europe and the US. It's still saying 
differentiated responsibilities, but it too has agreed to reduce its emissions. Next slide, please. So let's take a look at these emissions. And if we look here at this graph, um, you can see on the left-hand side, pre-industrial emissions. And then you look and you get to 1950 is right here. The 1950 emissions are still very, very much dominated by the European countries and the United States. You get to about 1970 and you start to see the beginning of an emergence of emissions from China. You get to 1990 and still emissions are dominated by the US and Europe, but China's share is rising. You get to today and China is 30% of CO2 emissions. So of course the time factor matters in this discussion. And just as a little footnote here, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change says we need to bring global emissions down by 43% of this peak by 2030, globally. That's what we're talking about is the target for 2030. And by 2050, bringing the emissions totally down to where they were at the period of around 1880. So that's basically what we're talking about when we're talking about net zero or when we're talking about the 2030 targets. Next slide, please. So I'm jumping a little in time because there's so much to cover. I have to cover three countries and a whole lot of history. But I mentioned that the European Union has been uh, the country or the region that has been kind of leading. Even though the US had this roller coaster ride and was in and was out, the European Union has been a steady supporter of climate action. And we saw already in 2019, the European Union saying, well, we need to do more. We need to rethink our economies. We need to um, have climate neutrality as a target for 2050. We need to promote circularity of our economy. We need to think about um, a fork to farm, um, rethink our agricultural system, our trade relations. So a big picture approach to thinking about climate change. Next slide, please. And the European Union in 2021 said, okay, we need to put this into um, framework legislation. They passed a European climate law. 2050 becomes a binding target for the European Union. Climate neutrality targets exist in many countries. Only the European Union has a binding target and also the target to reduce emissions by 55% of 1990 levels by 2030. So again, here we see Europe being one of the first movers globally with its EU climate law. Next slide, please. Related re legislation, the Fit for 55, sorry, it's in German. I should have put it in Portuguese, but... Uh, Fit for 55, further legislation where Europe is saying, okay, we need to also um, not just set targets, but we need to introduce laws and policies to implement them. Next, please. And what you see here is a ratcheting up within Europe of these targets. So in 2014, initial targets were set for 2030. They were revised in 2018. The 2021 law revised them again. Um, and in 2022, um, further changes. So what you're seeing is that the EU with time is ratcheting up its targets, um, both in terms of the emission reduction targets, 40% reduction was initial target compared to 1990, now a 55% target and pushing even higher. So within Europe, I'm taking the argument here that Europe has tried to be a climate leader all along. Sebastian would say, hey, did you remember that article I wrote that kind of questioned EU leadership? I'll get there in a minute, okay? Next slide, please. So Russian war in Ukraine, uh, terrible, terrible, terrible war. 
um, really a stupid war, but a war that is also having a lot of impacts and it's altering European um, energy and climate policy pretty dramatically. So as you all know, Europe was heavily dependent on imports of oil and gas and even coal for its economy and the largest single share was coming from Russia. So over 40% of the gas and um, of the coal that we were importing was coming from Russia and also a very high share of the oil. Next, please. In reaction to the war, we have seen some of the uh, policies that had been introduced in the past being reconsidered. And now with the repower EU policy, the EU once again saying, okay, we want leadership here and um, uh, tightening uh, standards and pushing up the policies for renewable energy and saying we need more renewable energy in the system faster um, at a larger scale. We need to um, decouple ourselves from Russian oil, coal and gas. And Europe has been quite successful. Um, gas imports from uh, Russia are um, um, down to zero in Germany. They're dramatically down for the European Union, the same for coal, a little bit less so for oil. But Europe has been remarkably fast at decoupling from Russian oil, coal, and gas, and dramatic growth in renewable electricity, especially solar PV in 2022 less so in wind. Next, please. Plus, a second reaction to the war in Ukraine was to say we need to focus more on hydrogen and decarbonized gases, carbon capture and storage, um, a new push in a technological area that Europe uh, sees as very important in addition to the renewables. Okay, I sound a little bit like a PR person right now for the European Commission, right? Not bad, okay. Next, please. So um, just to finish up that PR, uh, climate neutrality targets, the European Union coming in with 2050, Germany saying, um, well, we had 2050 until all those young people, Fridays for Future came in, and a couple of um, Southeast Asian uh, young people came in and said, we're gonna sue the German government for not doing enough for uh, climate action. And in response, the courts basically saying that Germany looks like a democracy for old people and not for young people. And the German government responding with a new target of 2045 instead of 2050, like Sweden and Finland. I point this out to you because I want to show you, I think we're beginning part of a, a race here. It's a competition to be the cleanest and the greenest fastest. We still don't know how we're going to get there, but the targets are um, uh, fascinating. China set a target for 2060. And as I'll talk about in a minute, um, when China sets targets, they never set targets that they think they can't meet. So I actually think China's 2060 target will be more like a 2057 target or a 2055 target. Europe sets targets it can't meet and then says, well, um, we almost got there. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm going to switch away from Europe for a minute and go to the United States and that roller coaster ride I was telling you about. So if you look at the history of US politics on energy, it's totally a roller coaster ride. You go back to the 1970s and it's all about OPEC oil shortages. You have um, Jimmy Carter coming in and saying, just wear a sweater. You have Ronald Reagan following him and saying, take down those solar panels from the White House. You get um, Clinton who comes in and says, we need the Kyoto Protocol because Al Gore is his vice president. George Bush comes in and says, Kyoto Protocol is dead. Then we get Obama and Obama says, oh yeah, Clinton was on the right track. Let's do Paris. You get Trump. Trump comes in and says, we're out of the Paris Agreement. Total roller coaster, depending on which government is in power. Next slide, please. So when you think of the United States, you don't think of steady climate leadership. You think of periods when the US is leading 
or pushing and periods where the US is blocking and it's the climate skeptics who are in power. The Biden administration has come in and has done something that I think shocked the European Union. And it shocked the European Union because nobody really expected this from the United States and not, didn't really expect that something like this could be pulled off in the United States. Biden succeeded in passing two bills that are, uh, at least the infrastructure bill was a bipartisan bill. It brought in Republican support as well. And what it is, is it's the single largest financing bill for climate action in history, not only for the United States, but when you look globally. And so the infrastructure bill is something that would also be very hard for Republicans to change in the future, because you would need to have a majority in Congress vote to remove the bill. So he succeeded in passing a bill that is also good for Republican states. So it's his way of trying to get action behind climate from both Republican and Democratic regions. Infrastructure bill was followed by the inflation reduction bill. Notice neither of them have the word climate in the bill because climate, and Kyoto, any of these words, they're almost like four letter words. You just don't say them because it brings up too much hard opposition. But if you say the, the inflation reduction bill, you can sell it a little better. But it's actually very much a climate bill. And a lot of the funding is going towards clean investment in uh, electric vehicles, in grid infrastructure, in um, digital technologies focused on climate. Next slide, please. So if we look at the infrastructure bill, just very quickly, you see investments for roads, bridges, and rails. Okay, that's not necessarily climate, but then you see tackling climate change, advancing environmental justice for poorer regions in the country, um, 90 billion US dollars for public transportation. Anybody who's ever traveled in the US knows that public transportation isn't that great. Uh, 7 billion for EV chargers, 66 billion for clean energy transmission, et cetera, et cetera. Next, please. And the Inflation Reduction Bill, which has $370 billion for targeting climate change and clean energy production, covers climate and environmental justice, just like the um, infrastructure bill. And it's focused on uh, bringing uh, technological investment in clean energy to the United States. Next, please. Remember that we're going to jump to China and then we'll come back to Europe. So China, remember back at the Kyoto Protocol times was saying, you caused the problem, we're not the problem. By the time Xi Jinping came to power, China was becoming part of the problem. China's share of emissions was really growing. And something we don't really understand very well in Europe is that Xi Jinping quite early on took environment into his agenda, partly because China was really suffering from very severe pollution. And uh, if you don't tackle pollution, then you have people who are getting sick and people who are getting sick don't like governments. So Xi Jinping quite early on introduced the concept of ecological civilization, and that has been driving climate and energy and environmental policy in China since, uh, actually since the mid 2000s. Um, he went in and he changed the 1989 basic environmental law, started a fight on air pollution, and introduced the CO2 emissions trading system that had its roots in, actually, the United States was then introduced in Europe and moved to China. Next, please. So I looked back at some old slides I had, and I pulled a few of them out. This is 
2015-2016 data. So this was the data of China right around the time of the Paris Agreement. And already what we are seeing right around the time of the Paris Agreement is that China was overtaking, not overtaking, head overtaken the European Union in clean energy investment. So China, by the time it was signing on to the Paris Agreement, was already pushing very hard into renewable energy in infrastructure, energy efficiency improvements. Next slide, please. And you started to see headlines like this. 2016, China's solar capacity grows by 81% doubles the total installed in the US. China had overtaken the United States by the time of the Paris Agreement in terms of how much it was installing of renewable energy. Next, please. This is just a little further into the future. We're now getting up to about 2017, 2018. And you can see that China has overtaken Europe, the US, Japan, and Germany, in terms of the renewable energy that it is installed. So Germany and Europe were the leaders in renewable energy in the 1990s, in the 2000s. But by the time you are hitting the mid 2010s, around the time that the Paris Agreement is being negotiated, China starts to take off, taking off as the leader in renewable energy development, installation, and production. Next, please. So responses in Europe to that were, okay, we should partner with China. And we began partnering with China. We started to form all kinds of memorandums of understanding we started to have European businesses going to China, doing a lot of joint ventures in China to become, to get an access into the market. But of course, in the process, also helping firms in China to expand and to strengthen their um, positions. Next, please. China, in the Paris Agreement, in, uh, initiated its first uh climate targets partly negotiated with obama obama china were negotiating what was to go on the nationally determined contributions were revised in 2021 so china's goals are now to peak emissions before 2030 to reduce emissions intensity by 65 percent from 2005 levels by 2030 to achieve 1,200 gigawatts of installed wind and solar capacity. That's 10 times the amount that is installed in Germany today. Uh, share non-fossil fuels in primary energy should reach 25%. China also considers nuclear to be a um, uh, non-fossil fuel energy. So they, they are putting a little bit of nuclear into that mix. So China is not yet at the European targets. Europe says 2050, China says 2060. But if you look at what is happening on the ground, China has been investing dramatically in not only renewables, which I've shown you in my, my documents here, but also in electric vehicles, in green hydrogen technologies, in battery technologies, um, and in the, the uh, manufacturing or production of the minerals that go into these technologies. Next, please. And you can see here, um, it's a little bit uh, complex, but the policies that China has introduced over time that have helped China to gain this leadership role. And you can see how as new policies have been introduced in China, 
China becomes a leading producer of cobalt. China becomes a leading producer of solar modules. We could show similar kinds of graphs for other kinds of technologies. Next, please. So Europe is now in this odd situation of having been the region that has been trying to push climate onto the agenda for all of these past 20, 25 years. And suddenly it's being overtaken by the United States with its new inf inflation reduction bill and its uh, infrastructure bill. And it's already acknowledging it's behind China. So in March of this year, the European Commission has proposed the start of a Green Deal industrial plan. And the Green Deal industrial plan is basically an effort to say, boy, if Europe doesn't wake up, green investment will leave Europe for the United States. It's already been leaving Europe for China. So how do you maintain Europe as a, um, as an economically viable player in the green economy of the future. So the Green Deal industrial plan is basically saying, hmm, we have too much regulatory bureaucratic um, mess. We need to get rid of these, these obstacles. We need to simplify the process of investing in Europe. We need to speed up and make financing available for industry, which is not something, Europe has not been putting financing into production facilities. This is now supposed to change, focusing more on skill sets and uh, looking at the entire value chain of products to see what needs to be done to make more of that production, um, including the development of or the, the extraction of minerals for products here in Europe. Next, please. Its response to the US and China is also taking on more concrete forms. We have the Net Zero Industry Act, which is being introduced with the effort to simplify and fast track permit permitting for um, renewable energy projects. Um, trying to develop more strategic planning of projects that are Europe-wide. So there are efforts now to really say we need Europe-wide industrial action um, and commission uh, helping to finance uh, developments in key technological areas for climate. The Critical Raw Materials Act focused on ensuring um, supply of the materials necessary for these industries and again, faster action or access to funding. Next, please. Also, the idea of creating a European sovereignty fund is a reaction to the US and Chinese developments, which is supposed to support um, the transitions both in the digital and the climate areas um, with the example coming from the EU CHIPS Act where the EU budget was being used to support research innovation and once again production which has not been the case in policy making in the past. Next please. So I leave you with a question. What does all of this mean? One, I like to think it means something good for climate. I like to think we are beginning to see a race for the top and that with the three largest emitters, China about 30% of emissions, the US about 14% of emissions, the EU about 8% of global emissions, that these three players are now entering into an industrial race to the top in a wide array of different sectors. Automobiles, batteries, renewable energy, green hydrogen, digital technologies for climate. I question, or I think, it may also be the continuation of the decline of the role of the WTO 
because it is putting more protectionist kinds of industrial policy into place, which means that we're having more nationalistic trade policies. This could be uh, something that is controlled and balanced so that it doesn't become a race uh, that could actually have lots of negative consequences if it goes too nationalistic. Um, but it certainly seems to be weakening the World Trade Organization. Um, again, I think the very big and important question here is, should we be fearful of this or should we actually embrace it and say, this race, this race to the top might be what we really need to address climate because so much of what's happened in the past hasn't been enough and maybe this will push us forward to act faster and do more because industry is now really looking at this as um, um, the path to the future. Big questions, and I leave it to all of you to solve them. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks very much, Miranda. Um, as usual, and as I had expected, there is uh, always this this kind of notion of hope in what you what you bring to us, and that's very welcome. I think we all need that. 